Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode of this fascinating series about the Aramaic Quran. Obviously, we are uh, showing you enough evidence to tie the Quran as we know it today, the language of the Quran in this case, to Aramaic as the prototype for what we know today as the Arabic Quran. In fact, today's topic has to do with why the Arabic or why the Arabic Quran. With me here in studio to uh, address this is our dear friend and brother in Christ, Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, thank you so much, of course, for all the work that you do. And uh, last time you did address the fact that when you put the Quran through the, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, the sip that you had uh, in here, uh, you will end up with the Bible, or at least you will have Jesus as the substance of the original Quran. But why the use of the Arabic, you know? Well, as you're sifting through, and we are sin sifted, the standard Islamic narrative, we're sifting it through, trying to find out what was there at the very beginning. And what we found was the Bible was there at the very beginning. When we sifted it through, we found that Jesus was there at the very beginning. But here are some curiosities. As you look at the Quran, it really underlines what we're saying here. Look and see what the Quran says today. Because as the Quran was, we're talking about the Ur text, the proto-Quran, that's just the original Quran. That was just maybe about 30% of the Quran that we're talking about, which is the original part. As they started introducing then the, the, the Quran, and they, they started put, taking the dots and putting new dots in, taking out the vowels and putting new vowels in, and changing the text and changing, ameliorating text. We, shot, we saw with chapter 23 how they added two more verses there between uh, uh, 1, 2, and th up to 5, then verse 6 and 7, and then 8, 9, 10, 11. They added those two verses which de decimated the whole idea of chastity, the same thing that in chapter 70, verse 25 to, 40, uh, to 35, uh, they decimated with verse 30 and 31. When you do that to the text, text, you start adding and taking away, deleting and accreting, you start adding more and more and more and more and more to it, you, you, you're you starting to realize that an awful lot of this gets de deformed. What happens is that you've now got to make a distinction between two different texts. Because that which now becomes the standard text, and remember this was introduced by Abdul Malik in uh, the late 7th century, where in 691 he has some of the earliest Quranic material that's up there. Uh, on the Dome of the Rock in the inscription mm -hmm. on the inner ambulatories. And he talks about, uh, he has chapter 4, verse 171 up there, but it's not the same chapter 4, verse 171 That's true. we have. It ha talks about the associators. What's the associators doing in the Shahada? La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah is what we have today, but what is the Sharaqatul doing in there? That shouldn't be there. The associator should not be there. It's there on the description. That was added at a later date. And you can see even that then was taken out because then once it's it's an attack against the Christians. That's right. Because the all those inscriptions are against the monophysite Christianity. The, uh, they're in Jerusalem down, looking down over the, the Church of the Sepulchre. So you can see historically that makes sense for that time period. But then in the Quran, you get verse after verse that keeps on reminding the people that this is the Arabic text. Let me just give you some. I, um, if you want to go to my video on chapter uh, uh, in, on December the 11th, I, I practice. And here, let me just go show you. Chapter two, 12, verse December 2. December the 11th, 2021. 2021. All right. December 11th, 2021. I unpacked this. I went through this, and I wanted to go through some of these references. So when you look with the Quran to, to Surah cha, uh, 12, verse 2, it says, We have sent it down as an Arab Big Quran, so you people may understand and have and understand the reason. Why would it say an Arabic Quran? Well, let's continue. In chapter 16, verse 103, it says, And we certainly know that they say it is only a human being who teaches the prophet. The tongue of the one they refer to is foreign. Oh, wait, it's talking about another language here. And this Quran is in clear Arabic language. So it's already making distinction. That which the prophets teach is foreign, but now which we teach in is in the Arabic language. So it's again inferring that there's something unique about this text. In chapter 42, verse 7, it says, So we have revealed an Arabic Quran to you in order that you may warn the capital city and all who live nearby. Warn from what? What are they warning against? If it's always been an Arabic, if this is the eternal Quran that has always existed on those internal tablets that was already revealed to Muhammad in its entirety, then how is it then? Why are they making this warning? How warning against what? You're warning, you need, you need to see there's something that they're referring to. Chapter 43, verse 3 continues on the same thing. Behold, we have made it a Quran in clear Arabic language that you may fully understand. So now it's there's something else that would help, that's not understandable. Now it's understandable. And uh, the Arabic Quran in an Arabic language for the Arabic people. And uh, I'm sorry, continue on. Why do we need 
Um, this is chapter 44, verse 58. We have made the Quran easy in your language so that they may take heed. Why do we need an Arabic Quran in the Arabic language for the Arabic people? Well, chapter 41, verse 44 is the answer. And here is where you really need to zero in on. Now, according to chapter 41, if we may have made it a Quran in a non-Arabic tongue, they would surely have said, why is it that its verses have not been made clear? Why? A foreign tongue? By an Arab? Mm -hmm. Say, for those who accept it, this is guidance and medicine for a wholesome life. But as for those who do not believe that the Arabs or the non-Arabs, in their ears is deafness, and so it remains obscure to them. They are like people who are called to them afar. So what's going on here? What's going on here? It's whole, this whole idea is that these phrases in the Quran were making distinction between the Arabic Quran and something other which was earlier and was not in Arabic, but was in a foreign language. So you can see it's pretty clear. It's referring to an earlier text in a foreign tongue that is not made clear. To understand this, what I intimated in a number, a number of episodes ago, back in the seventh century, you had the Aramaic, which is liturgical language. And then you had the Arabic, which was layman's term language, which was used by the working class people. And the working class people did not speak Aramaic that well. Some of them did, but many of them did not because it was a academic language it was for the educated. And so they were down here. And now this Quran is being made into their language. And now they're saying they're warning about that earlier one, that one that's come before, that one that is in a foreign tongue uh, that is not very clear. But this is clear to you. This is clear to that's you. That's right. Now it's clear to you why. Because this is an Arabic language for the Arabic people in the, your text is what it's saying. That would only make sense if there had been something earlier that was not Arabic. Mm -hmm. In this case, the Aramaic. That's why now you can see even the Quran shows from where and who it's for. It's for those who speak Arabic. It's those who do no longer are part of that liturgical circle because those liturgical Aramaic, those are the Christians. It's making distinction between the foreign tongue of the Christians and now the, the language of the Arabs. Remember, Islam, the word, had not yet been introduced. Muslim, the people, have not been introduced yet. That's why there's no thinking about Christians and Muslims because this was too early. That was only introduced in about 730. Can you not understand when you look at the historical context, this now makes sense. Be careful of that language. Be careful of those texts. Now let's get it in a clear text for the Arabic people in the Arabic language, in your language. Your language, meaning the Arab people. And what do you think um, was behind doing this, for instance? Is it a uh, maybe the Arabs, uh, when they borrowed all of this, they began to attack the fact that this is not foreign? because people were noticing there is some foreign language in there and they wanted to justify that it's actually done in Arabic and they had to really reinterpret things or, or reread it differently? Well, obviously this is happening much later. This is happening in the eighth century. So these are much later. Remember, we have said this over and over again. The Ur Quran, the archetypal Quran, that which comes from this book was from the seventh century. Once they started pulling this out and started bastardizing and adding different and creating and deleting and changing it, they then started adding an awful lot of more stories to it. Some of it was borrowed from other sources, but some of it all was also about the man himself, the person that starts to be introduced. And, and that's why you only have four references to him. But once that happens, then you start also have to start to give him a place. That's why chapter 33, if you look at chapter 33, it's all about the wives of this person and all the relationship. That had to have been added at a later date, now that the man was made. But then at some point, this had to be stopped and canonized. Once it got canonized, once it got the final text, and I think it was about the mid-8th century, about the time the top copy comes into being, about 749, mid-8th century, that's when the canonization happens. From that time on, they cannot change the text because now it's all over all over that part of the world. From that point on then, they then had to they introduce who this man was and who this person was and also what the stories behind him. Can you then understand then why the stories about the man that supposedly in this book was only named four times, that takes another 70 years for them to create. Right. And that was done in 833 with Ibn Hisham. But then you need to have, to be, once you got the stories of the person who this book is supposedly about, you then have to give them a lot of sayings. You've got to have a lot of references to him. That takes another 40 years. So you're talking about 110 years later before that is introduced by Al-Buhari. But remember what Al-Buhari, and this is very, it's right, I mean, it's right there. We know this about this. Al-Buhari was given 660,000 
Sorry, 600,000 600, of 60, these. 60,000, actually. 600, okay, I've been told 600,000, you've been told 660,000. How much did he, what does he do with this? And where did this 600,000 come from? Well, this is all the earlier references that are coming through the Umayyad period. So there's reams and reams and reams about everything that was happening, going on during this 120 years that we're going to try to uncover. And by the time Al-Buhari is given this in the late 9th century, he then whittles away, tick, 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 throws away 98% of it and only retains 2%, 7,397. From 660,000 down to 7,397, where in the world and what happened to that 98%? Well, that 98% is what we want to look at. It's all been destroyed. Why do you think it was destroyed? Because that is what was going on in the intervening 120 years. And is that material that I would suggest is where we would find the original text, is where we would find the original story and how they had to be changed and ameliorated and deleted and accreted. It took them uh, up till the late 9th century before that was finally canonized. Once they did that, then they had to go and start unpacking this book because this book is full of contradictions. This book is full of these mysterious material that no one understood. So that's why the Tafsir only gets introduced in 923. That's the 10th century. So by the 10th century, when they get this introduced by Al-Tabari, look and see what Al-Tabari does. He gives you everything. He gives you all kinds of contradictory stories. He's the first one to do this. Right. Once he shuts up, then everybody starts putting it into an amalgamated form. And that's why Al-Tabari is such a, it's such a, 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 a golden piece of literature because he's actually giving us a window into what has been censored, what has been sanitized. Yeah. So I would say this is something that you're seeing. You're seeing a, 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 you're seeing a, an evolution of not only a religion, but an evolution of a man, a book, and a place. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the belief that Artabari actually is a convert from Christianity. But speaking of that, I think, uh, what is his name? Lolling? You said? Dr. Gunther Lolling. Yeah, so Lolling mentioned something uh, in his book that uh, the, the word Islam actually was used initially in a derogatory way against Jews and Christians who converted to Islam, uh, meaning they submitted themselves to the cult itself outside of the uh, uh, the mainstream, the orthodoxy. Do you think uh, you know this might have contributed to the many sources uh, that were utilized, basically in the Quran? They bring in their knowledge with them, bring in these hymnals with them, and now that they're part of a new movement or a cult, for instance, they are feeding into the content of this new book. Yeah, I would suggest so, but there's also something else that we need to be careful of, and we and we're realizing if. Abdul Malik, and you need to start with Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is the one who actually is the first to introduce this idea of an Arabic people for an Arabic place in Arabic Quran. And he does this by putting the largest building of its day, the Dome of the Rock, right there in Jerusalem. And he sits it above the Church of the Sepulchre. Now he's doing two things simultaneously. He is not only putting and making a political statement, he's making a theological statement because he's an Aryan. Mm -hmm. He is does not believe in the divinity of Jesus. He does not believe in the Trinity and he doesn't believe in his sonship. That's why those are so striking there on the Dome of the Rock. Those are attacks on chapter four, verse 171, on this mm -hmm. inscriptions. It's also on the coins. But he is one that introduces that. Now he goes, because of that on the coins, Justinian II, up in the Byzantine world, Justinian II, who's the emperor, goes to war with him. He's so angered by what, what Dabdan Malik does. Who wins the war? Justinian II loses. Mm -hmm. Abdul Malik wins that war in 691. What does Abdul Malik do next? He introduces a brand new coin with himself sitting with his sword in 693. Look at me now, and there's the Shahada, and it's taken out. The it's it's taken out. It's taken out uh, uh, all the references to the Byzantine cross on the back. That has been now thrown out, and now it's just scripts. Four years later, or three years later, he then introduces a brand new coin where he's taken even his image out, and he is now introducing the Shahada in its pure form. More than that. He's also saying, God has no son, and we are going to conquer you. We're going to overwhelm you. This is against, he is now, this is bravado. This is triumphalism. This is now the, no, the new man on the block. He now controls all that swallow land. And this is a thumb your nose at Justinian. He has built the building, uh, the building that in 691 that now sits right there where the Jews was the holiest place for the Jews. This was the, the temple of David. This is the Holy of Holies. This is where the original Kaaba was. Kaaba is also Hebrew, means the square. It is where Mount Moriah was. It's where Marwa and Safa were. It's where everything was right there. And he builds this greatest building that's still there today. Now, once he has done that, he's got a problem. Can you see his difficulty? He doesn't have what the Jews and Christians have. 
He doesn't have a prophetic line like they have. He doesn't have a revelation like they have. The two thing he needs more than anything else is a prophetic line. And remember, he is from an Ishmaelite. He comes from Merv. Merv is way up in Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. Marwan, that's the name. The Marwan are the people from Merv. He comes from way up there. And they do not have a prophetic line like the Jews and the Christians. And yet the Jews and the Christians have a scripture that they don't have. So you've got to do something. You've got to provide a, a, a scripture and you've got to provide a prophetic line. So they already are from the line of Ishmael. So they've got to have a prophet that's in that line. Well, there are no prophets from Ishmael. There's nothing there. See if you can find where his lineage is. Who are the prophets? Show me one prophet that's from Ishmael in this book. Therefore, this person that he that was introduced as Muhammad, who was introduced there on the Dome of the Rock and on the coins and the protocols, it looks like he is the one that becomes, but this doesn't happen during Abdul Malik's time. This happens during the time of Mamun. This, I'm sorry, Mamun. This happens in the 730s. And this is what John of Damascus is referring to. Who is this? This is a heresy you're talking about. Right. And he has a whole book against the heresies. This is a Christian heresy. So this is a Christian heresy against Byzantine monophysitism. And what's fascinating is at this time that they have to create their own book. So that's why, what do you do when you have to create a book? Well, you borrow everything you can. You borrow right, left, and center. And that's why you are you're borrowing all these lectionaries. You're borrowing these homilies. You're borrowing these beautiful hymns. And you're borrowing these Jewish apocryphal writings. You're borrowing Gnostic writings. You're also borrowing Persian writings. And you're also borrowing Buddhist writings. There's all kinds of amelioration in there. And as you're borrowing them, you're putting them into Arabic and you're bastardizing it by different putting the dharakas where you want to so it all comes to one thing. That's why the Quran is so confusing. That's why there's no chronology. That's why there's no, you look at it, it goes all over the place. Story doesn't begin, stories don't end. They get slapped in the middle of another story. There's contradiction after contradiction. Take a look at all the Greek, the Greek stories that are in there. Enormous stuff. You can see why. They borrowed right, left, and center. That's why it is one of the worst books when it comes to its, its cogency. It doesn't have any cogency. Well, that's what you would expect when it's done rather hurriedly. And that's why it takes them so long to finally make sense of it all. That all happens in the 10th century. So it looks like what we're seeing is an evolution of a man who starts a, a cult. It is a cult. This is why everybody looked at them as a cult. And, but he won the battle. So now he is trying to get an identity. If you're trying to get an identity, you've got to have a book and a man. Right. And once you have the book and the man, then you have to have the place. Amen. So when was the place to introduce? Well, that takes place in the 8th century. Ooh, it all fits to a place. It all fits to a piece. That we're going to conclude with. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Next time, we will give you the conclusion of this entire video series. Hopefully, you've enjoyed it. Make sure to share it with others. Make sure you invite our Muslim friends to watch it. Make sure you get a hold of these books that we have recommended to you. And make sure you interact with us as well. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.